And Mike, you have the floor. Fantastic. Thank you so very much. Um, uh, one thing just to confirm uh, that you all can see my screen. Um, I can see. It. All right. Got a thumbs up. Fantastic. So, uh, yeah, um, please definitely want to have this a very a, a, as a very kind of interactive uh, discussion. So please feel free to to ask questions uh, or go ahead and kind of pop them in the, the chat. Let me just make sure that I can see the chat as well. Well, I can't. But if, in any case, uh, if anyone can read out anything that comes through chat, yeah, but sure definitely thing. want to make it uh, interactive. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll talk about EAA, and um, there are kind of a lot of different definitions when we think about when we talk about EAA, um, and that's one of the reasons that led me to kind of put in this this introduction. So, um, we'll we'll first talk about well, what is it? Um, kind of what its history uh, has been. Why in the world would, would anyone want to do EAA? Um, want to set some realistic expectations. We'll cover some of the equipment that's needed. Um, we'll cover some really basic setups. And um, I think it's also important to talk about some of the concepts and, and processes. Again, it won't be a, a really in-depth tutorial, but um, again, the, the just the, the concepts. And then I'll have a, a few examples and then we'll have time for questions and answers. So. We'll go ahead and get started. So, really, what what is it? Um, and it's you, you get a lot of people that ask, is it observing or is it imaging? And when you think about kind of the whole spectrum across the things, you've got uh, visual on the one side, you've got imaging or astrophotography on the other, and honestly, it's both and neither all at the same time. And it just really falls uh, in between. There are so many similarities between both EA between visual observing and astrophotography, um, and that it's it's almost kind of this um, uh, spectrum, if you will, uh, from one end to the other. Um, so what is EAA? Um, and definitions will vary. Again, I think if you ask, um, you know, five different uh, folks on on the EAA uh, forums, um, you'll get six different answers. Uh, but here's what I think, and it came out of video astronomy. And a lot of times the two are uh, the two uh, uh, titles are used um, uh, pretty much indiscriminately: video astronomy and electronically assisted astronomy. Um, but it is really about observing the object as close as possible to kind of real time, and it's not about collecting data for later. You can do that if you want, but it's really about uh, it, it's about the now. Uh, and instead of an eyepiece, you're using some sort of camera or something that's going to increase sensitivity. And it's all about in, in enhancing your view now. Um, you know, we want to exploit the technology, whether that's in a camera or it's a night di uh, vision device, or if it's a computer, um, that it's able to improve or enhance your view right now. And most purists, I think, will agree that if you actually do some post-process, it's no longer EAA, EAA, me, EAA, it's imaging. And of course, on cloudy nights, it's been quite an evolving subject. It has gone from all sorts of, you know, the, the different subforums that actually moved it multiple times. Uh, I no longer can keep can keep up with, you know, where, where they're storing it. Um, but a first breakdown of EAA, we've got night. Uh, vision devices um, and basically have this uh, piece of technology that replaces the standard eyepiece. Um, all different types that will use uh, some phosphorus um, and the, um, the sensitivity is absolutely amazing. I've looked through a 30 inch um, daub with the night uh, vision uh, device and it's it's breathtaking how much you can see and it's all just absolutely immediate. Um, you got those live views. It's it's awesome, but it is expensive. It is incredibly expensive. Um, then we kind of jump over to a camera in place of an eyepiece. So we can use a DSLR. You can use a dedicated astronomy camera. Um, you can even use a security camera. Um, and again, it's still in place of the eyepiece. So basically you're looking at prime focus. 
Um, you can use items in video, excuse me, video mode, especially kind of a DSLR, or you can use a dedicated astronomy camera and take some longer exposures that you eventually combine or stack together. Um, and I think it's this sort of this camera in place of the eyepiece that's becoming the most popular form um, of uh, electronic assistance. And then we have the old, uh, just put a camera in the eyepiece. Um, so you can use your telescope, existing eyepieces, cameras, and you're basically doing the projection. Um, you can pretty much use any camera. I really like some of the smartphones. And if you use a smartphone, I highly recommend the uh, Celestron um, device that holds the smartphone. They call it the Nex um, uh, or the NEXYZ. Um, it allows you to make very, very, uh, you know, uh, precision sorts of movements, both in the up and down, left and right, and also kind of the third dimension, if you will. So you can get it right over the eyepiece. Um, if you look at some of the other styles where you it's it's hard to get that really kind of uh, exact uh, movement to get it centered around the eyepiece. And it's kind of a, an exercise in frustration. I really like the um, piece. Um, again, you do need an adapter or some sort of threaded connections. Uh, I know that the Hyperion or the Vader Hyperion eyepieces are threaded and you can get some uh, adapters. But basically, those are the kind of uh, you know breakdowns of EAA. And we're going to focus more on the camera to the eyepiece or camera over the eyepiece uh, portions. So when we think about um, where this came from, um, I, it, it actually, the history is quite um, impressive. It goes back to 1928, uh, where an article uh, from the Lick Observatory was published talking about the emerging technology of television, uh, broadcasting views from a telescope. Um, and really, really interesting, uh, but I wanna kind of highlight uh, a couple pieces where they're talking about the extreme sensitivity and amplification powers of the vacuum tube. I guess we could pretty much put a chip in there instead of a vacuum tube, um, but that's going to find uh, this application in astronomy. Like, wow, they, they, they honestly really kind of uh, had, had a, a good view into the future. Um, and there's another part where they're talking about the sensitivity um, of you know, the, 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 the sending apparatus that will like, magnify um, greatly upon the reception. So it's just very interesting the way they, they talk about it. And further in the article, they even talk about having three different cameras and uh, with, you know, the, basically the, the different filters on there to create a color. Uh, so again, really, really almost ahead of its time, but in very interesting article. Um, the next piece I was able to find was this uh, particular picture of a gentleman from the Sydney Amateur Astronomers. Um, and you can see here, he's got his uh, black and white TV. He's got um, what looks to be like a very interesting camera, um, but I'm more impressed with his outfit for observing. Um, I can't say that in my 20 years, 25 years of, of being uh, an amateur uh, astronomer, I've ever seen someone observing um, uh, with that particular uniform. Um, then it starts getting a bit more, um, uh, I, I'd say commonplace uh, in the mid 1990s, where amateurs begin to experiment with um, these CCT, CCTV um, uh, one of the most popular being the uh, Super Circuits uh, PC23. Um, and it was good for solar system objects, bright objects. In the late 90s, uh, we had companies like Stellacam and Mallencam um, came out with more sensitive uh, chips, but they were smaller. You only got a very kind of, you know, uh, a very small field of view when using it with your telescope. Um, in the 2000s, innovation kept coming. Uh, we were able to get some of the um, you know, uh, chips that would do color, enhancements in cooling. 
Uh, and then people started experimenting with these uh, newer security cameras, uh, such as the LN300 and the Samsung uh, models were also really, really popular. And these were just security cameras. Um, and we're here now at the point where we're getting much larger chips, we're getting incredibly low read noise, um, and we're now able to control the cameras with a single USB cable control, uh, which is a huge step forward from you know 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and we've also got the software is allowing some incredible uh, new things um, in terms of longer exposures, we're getting better views um, and we can do real time enhancements, whether you're, you're stretching the color, you're using you know, dark subtraction, uh, you're really improving the views in, in kind of real time. So from there, we'll just talk about, now that we have a little history, well, why in the world would anyone wanna do EAA? Um, so I'm gonna do a bit of a comparison here. And this is a sketch uh, that I found on Cloudy Nights uh, from a gentleman uh, in Greenbrier County, West Virginia. Now we're looking um, at a sketch done through a 14 inch SCT. Uh, and he's got some skies that I would be very, very jealous of. Uh, don't have them here in North Carolina, uh, but this is what he's able to see. Now, compare that to a screen grab. Now, this is a uh, one of the first cameras that I had. So this is uh, circa um, 2016, 2017, and it's just a security camera using my 11 SCT. And I'm taking this through port uh, sky. So it's just 20 seconds of, of basically integration. Now, if we look and try and find the dimmest object that the sketch shows, and I think I could find the dimmest object in the uh, screen. We have these two different uh, with, uh, you know, uh, basically about a three magnitude difference. And when you think about it, a 14 inch SCT has 62% more light gathering ability than an 11 inch and a magnitude 18.45 star is almost 20 times dimmer than a 15 uh, mag uh, magnitude star. And we're not even accounting for the fact that this individual had better uh, sky. So this is really, I think, one of the best examples I can show of how much more you're able to get uh, using EAA uh, versus a traditional eyepiece. And again, it's a just it's it's a, the clarity um, and the additional detail. Um, another reason is to overcome light pollution. Um, this was taken from a gentleman um, just outside of London in their zone four. Um, very, very light polluted skies. And with his 12 inch SCT doing a 10 second um, uh, stack, he's able to get the ring nebula. And uh, I mean, that's pretty impressive. Um, I'm not sure I could visibly see the ring nebula even from downtown Raleigh. Um, and we definitely aren't as light polluted as London. Um, it's also a fantastic outreach tool. Um, and I just want to kind of highlight the oval kind of down towards the middle uh, or the center uh, bottom. Uh, that's a picture of me this past December when we were celebrating um, the uh, basically the Apollo 17 launch, uh, the 50th anniversary. So we had a moonwalk uh, for the kids. Uh, they were coming out to to hear um, a presentation uh, at the museum, and we literally were able to have the kids come and walk on the sidewalk where we were presenting um, the moon, and it was actually a, a really big hit with folks. But it is a great outreach tool, and you can see examples of where we uh, display something on the ground, or we wind up, um, you know, just having a, um, a, a screen for folks to look at. Now, um, some other reasons why we might want to do it. Um, we have, the, as, as many of us are, are quite aware, um, our aging eyes are getting more and more um, difficult <laughs> to enjoy a, a, an eyepiece. Um, 
if you're doing kind of outreach or anything with kids or grandkids, uh, young children oftentimes have difficulty looking through an eyepiece. So this is a great way uh, to engage them uh, in, in astronomy. Uh, you're able to get images in color rather than shades of gray. Um, you can do internet or virtual star parties. We did this quite a bit uh, during COVID. Um, it's actually a fantastic way to do kind of remote uh, viewing. Uh, we certainly don't have the winter nights um, uh, or the cold winter nights in North Carolina like you all get in Michigan, but I grew up in Chicago, so I am, uh, I, I do remember those. Um, so you can have this set up and I can be in here in my nice cozy um, uh, office and I can have a scope outside and I can completely control and view things real time uh, that way. Um, you're able to capture the photons more effectively than the human eye, which basically means that you're, um, you're able to use a smaller aperture scope and get better views or at least more detailed and brighter views. So you can kind of fight that, um, uh, that, that desire to um, increase your aperture of scope. Um, for me, this allows for viewing dozens of objects in an evening instead of if I'm just doing, if I were to do imaging, you're only going to get one to two, maybe three if you're out all night um, in, in terms of the targets that you're going to capture. And it's also a way to practice socially distant astronomy. Um, and, and, you know, again, you just never know. I, it seems like we're back, we're getting kind of up into a uh, uh, a bit of a spike in terms of COVID cases. Um, don't know if that will ever come back to the point where, you know, we're still going to try and be, you know, virtually distant, but it's an option. Um, so why not do it? Because there, there are some drawbacks, um, unfortunately. Now, Depending on your setup, it can be much more difficult to set, to go ahead and put everything together, operate and take down. You've got more cables. You've got to have a model. Um, there's a bunch of extra equipment that's needed as well. And you need power. Um, and my personal setup, I wind up using a 100 amp hour lithium battery, which is nice and light. Um, but I'm able to use that. It, it lasts me a good full two nights, maybe three, depending on how it goes. But um, yeah, you, you bring some power with you. Um, additionally, the use of projectors or monitors or even laptop screens, um, you definitely are going to saturate a particular area with, uh, with, with stray light. So um, a call to make sure that we're all practicing good uh, astro neighbor behavior. I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, and without a doubt, more can go wrong um, with uh, EAA than just with a nice eyepiece. Um, so there, there have been nights where I just kind of chase my tail trying to figure out why things won't work. Um, and it's usually because I skipped a step in the setup, but yeah, um, definitely more can go wrong or God forbid you actually left that one you know key piece of a, of a cable and now you're not able to connect everything. Um, additionally, it's a steep learning curve, um, especially on some of the software. I recommend you know several nights of experimentation. I got hooked by attending the East Coast Video Astronomy Rendezvous at Var, um, and this place where uh, if you took out your eyepieces, they were going to make fun of you. So that was a great way. It was a week long, and I was just really impressed with what I was able to accomplish and, and learn just in that um, short uh, period of time. And that basically, I got the 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 for it and kind of never looked back. Um, now, what are some things that are important in terms of kind of setting expectations? Um, we already discussed about the light graph. So definitely, um, I've heard it said anywhere from three to six times, depending upon your, your uh, I think six might be an exaggeration, but definitely um, three times, uh, I think, is, is, uh, is there. Uh, it is fantastic on dim objects like galaxies, nebulas, and uh, globular clusters. However, you're not going to get that same kind of beautiful shimmering um, 
of open clusters. I, I don't think you can ever get away from, um, you know, just that, uh, uh, you know, the interaction you get from, from actually doing it. Um, it can, you know, a camera is not going to compete with the dynamic range of a human eye. So honestly, it's not good on planets, especially something like Jupiter. You're either going to, you know, see Jupiter. Um, and if you want to see the moons, you've got to really, um, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, shorten the, or actually um, expand or uh, push a little bit longer. Jupiter gets completely blown out, but then you can see the moon. In terms of uh, planetary um, stuff, I always go visual. Uh, don't even bother with EAA there. And you're not going to get the photographic qualities uh, you know, the photographic views with only a few tens of seconds to maybe just a few minutes of data and then no processing. Um, so here's an example of uh, with my very first camera, this was 20 seconds of integration uh, on um, the Whirlpool. Now using my existing camera, um, this is about five minutes of stacked um, views. Again, this is literally as I saw it after five minutes. And I, I think it's a fantastic view. However, compare that with a C11 that's done 40 or 75 minutes of exposure and has been processed. It's not the same. So you're not going to see that same level of, uh, again, photographic quality of views uh, with, with EAA. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the equipment that's needed. Um, I always recommend start with what you have, um, smartphone. Uh, I talked briefly about the um, Celestron, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, view or the, 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 doc, the, the adapter. And this is just a uh, video that I was able to take just of the moon and on a four inch refractor, um, in fact, the doublet, so you can see some little bit of false color. But you know, it's a, it's a, to me, it was a really interesting uh, way to look at it. I was sharing it with neighbors, and it was very easy for all the kids to come around and look at it right on the smartphone. Um, it's so, it's, it's amazing what you can do just with a smartphone and with um, a telescope. A DSLR, many of them have video mode, uh, and there is software out there that will allow you to do live stacking um, with DSLRs. Uh, so again, kind of uh, doing the EAA, um, you know, what do you call it? putting together lots of, of blame. And then there's also the dedicated astronomy camera. Um, and again, computer controlled uh, allows the user to vary all kinds of settings um, and be able to kind of get just exactly what you need for those conditions. So whether it's your integration or exposure time, your color balance, gain, gamma, et cetera, um, all things can be um, uh, very quickly adapted uh, using a dedicated astronomy camera. And in terms of preferences, um, if someone wants to just kind of dip their toe into the um, EAA world, I recommend um, this particular product. It's called the Revolution 2 Kit. It's uh, pretty inexpensive and simple. Uh, it's just a CCD camera. Um, there's no computer required. They're very sensitive, but unfortunately the resolution is low. It's a lot like what I had with my first EAA camera or video astronomy camera, and it does have a higher read noise. Uh, now, if you really want to go to higher quality pictures, and that's what I wanted to do, um, I went the route of getting a CMOS chip uh, camera um, and now starting to use computer software um, to help uh, enhance that view. It has much higher resolution. It's got phenomenal read noise, but it's not as, as sensitive. So you've got to be able to take longer. You've got to integrate longer with the um with the CCD cameras and, and the other setups, they're just so sensitive that you, you've got this amazing view in 20 seconds or less. Uh, and I personally uh, like to use a cooled camera um, because that helps establish uh, kind of a, a set temperature for uh, darks and things like that, dark frame subtraction. Um, 
as far as telescopes, pretty much uh, any scope will do um, as long as it can reach focus with the camera. The real only caveat is to just make sure that whatever focuser you have can take the weight of the camera um, as well as any other gear. And you know, here's a pretty good example of a, um, a very uh, light, flimsy uh, beginner scope focuser and something that's a little bit beefier. Um, aperture is much less important um, with EAA um, than its its focal length. So you, know, you, you want to try and uh, make sure a telescope has a shorter focal length. Although I do use a C a chassis focal length of 2,800 uh, millimeters. Um, but just like in astrophotography, the shorter the focal length, the faster, uh, the better. Um, EAA tends to favor cameras with smaller sensors. So the combination of that longer focal length scope plus a, a small camera sensor results in that, that narrow field of view, which you want to make sure that uh, at least with an SCT, you can kind of change that with focal reducers and et, et, et cetera. Uh, and then lastly, the larger the telescope aperture, the more susceptible it is to with all, all the kinds of issues, whether it's like motion, uh, disturbances, etc. In terms of mounts, um, again, uh, we have a lot of different options. And um, I think in many cases, um, I love this little graphic that we, I put in here that, um, again, it helps people that are kind of newer to astronomy, but it talks about, you know, how is it an alt as mount going to move through uh, the sky and how to change your view through the telescope versus equatorial uh, mount. So again, equatorial, you always keep that same view. Um, the alt as you, the object is going to rotate. With that, um, knowing uh, that information, uh, and we'll also talk the diff the, about the difference between a capture or a single versus the total amount of exposure time. Um, now, uh, a lot is going to depend on what objects you're viewing and kind of how right they are. But if you've got a single, um, you know, for any single exposure, excuse me, exposure, 15 seconds uh, will work with pretty much any alt as mount that will track. Uh, if you need to do a exposure that's greater than 15 seconds, the wisdom is definitely get something that's equatorial or wedge mounted uh, due to the rotation. Uh, but even for some of the brightest objects, the very first time I tried EAA with the um, uh, with M fifty seven, the ring nebula, and I was able to get it manually through a, uh, a six inch uh, Doran dock, and it was pretty, but I was. Able to get it. Um, and what really makes it impressive these days is a lot of software packages today that will compensate for tracking errors and field rotation. So they'll de-rotate the image um, or the, the objects and still allow you to stack it. Um, I mentioned focal reducers. Again, uh, very important, especially if you're, you've got a long focal length. Um, I, uh, I've got one that's a uh, basically a 0.33 uh, focal reducer. Um, that really messes up the outside edges. Uh, so I'm thinking about a hyperstar. Uh, we'll see what the uh, see what my my wife says if she's willing to let me purchase one. Um, if you're gonna do EAA, you're gonna need some to put on. Um, whether that's um, a camera that you will mount right onto, uh, or sorry, a monitor that will right mount right to the camera, such as that kind of first in the top left. Um, that mounts right to the uh, to the Revolution 2. Um, you can see an SCT there that has a, a screen mounted to uh, the, the, the top of its uh, scope. Um, you've got folks using, you know, kind of TVs and computers uh, from their garage, uh, laptops. In fact, that uh, the view on the top far right is actually from my uh, setup. Uh, I've got a, a large, um, 24 inch monitor plus a small uh, 15 inch monitor. Uh, but you can see there are lots of different ways to set up um, that monitor 
um, that TV, whatever your equipment's going to require. Um, if you've got an analog out camera like the uh, Revolution 2 um, camera or you know some of the older CCD cameras, um, you're, if you want to capture it on your laptop or computer or something like that, you're going to need a video grabber. And there are lots of different options out there. Um, my experience was that I would get these weird kind of random hot pixels um, on the screen, and but they would go in and out. So they weren't just hot pixels. They were actually would, would flash in and out. Um, and these are anomalies that are created with the analog to digital conversion. And when you think about some of these, um, the camera is digital. It's it's using a sensor um, and and capturing it digitally. It converts it to analog, and then you're now trying to convert it back to digital. So um, again, it's it's not the most efficient process, but uh, I would get those anomalies. Um, software is pretty impressive um, uh, out there. If you've got a Malin Cam, I've heard very great things about their Milo uh, stick. Uh, software, uh, but again, it's proprietary, so only a Malin, Malin Cam camera can use it. Uh, Affinity, Infinity software have also the same thing. Um, it's very highly regarded, but only available to be used with some ATIC cameras. Um, Low Starlight, yet another version <laughs> of proprietary software for the Starlight Express cameras. Um, Astrolive. I think this is now officially defunct. Um, it was a, originally a one-man show. They had gotten into a partnership with ZWO, but now I'm pretty sure it's defunct. Uh, I used this uh, uh, for the first. This is my first piece of software. And it actually worked pretty well. Um, my preference is SharpCap. Um, it's very popular. Uh, there are some free versions out there, but even the full-blown suite, I think, is $15 a year. Um, and it is, um, I think, by far now the most um, uh, preferred piece of software out there for EAA. Uh, there's something called Astro Tersh excuse me, Astro Toaster for uh, DSLR and some CCD cameras. Um, and then... ZW, basically ZWO's ASI Air um, will only work with their cameras, runs on prepared, proprietary software. But to me, one of the real big um, pluses here is that it's all very integrated um, and you can basically just use the ZWO. You can connect with an iPad, a phone or anything. You don't actually need a full laptop or a computer um, uh, to run this. It's live ability is not as good as sharp but they're working on it so who knows um, some other things just to consider um, I mentioned earlier about uh, practicing uh, good astro neighbor um, behaviors so you want to try and shield that uh, laptop that monitor and um, Unfortunately, putting a you know, red film or one of those ruby red um, screens, that becomes the purpose of doing EAA because now everything's in red and you're not able to see that same detail. So um, again, it's good to make sure that you're shielding it somehow, you're pointing it away from other um, astronomers, et cetera. Uh, you can use small tents, shelters, blinds. Um, what just popped up is my setup. Um, I use an ice fishing shelter, and I can only imagine what the uh, manufacturer or the person that's the, the the company that sold this thought about uh, shipping one of these things to North Carolina. Let's just, our our lakes do not freeze uh, over the winter time, but it really it's blacked out. Um, I like the fact I like the fact that if ever it starts wear or any of the blackout material starts to wear down well then whatever light escapes uh will kind of be in that that reddish uh color and it's amazing it is 100 blacked out uh, i can have a disco party going in, inside and no one can see it from uh, the, the light leak from the outside uh, i've seen people do a setup where they're using their teardrop trailer like a little uh, pop-up and then um you might want to invest in some remote control, uh, focus masks, 
things very, very easy, uh, as do either automated focusers or remote focusers. It really makes life um, much easier. And then, of course, I, I mentioned you're going to need uh, some field power, a battery box, um, you know, those uh, along the, that line. Um, I'm going to talk real briefly about just the basic steps. And um, this is just kind of super, super basic. Uh, you've got the telescope. In this case, you have a CCD camera. You've got to power the camera. And then you also have to send um, the analog video out to a TV or, or something. Um, the next setup, uh, and you can, and unfortunately, with, whoops, with this view, you have to by pushing buttons on the back. It, it, and unfortunately, it doesn't work very well. Um, the next one is where, okay, you kind of say, yeah, well, we'll ditch the heavy TV, we'll add um, a video grabber, I can send it to a computer um, and it can be much easier. Um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a lighter weight setup again, but you're still using um, a, a, a CCD camera. That means you've got to power it and, and you've got you know, a few more cords. Um, and then lastly, you've got the idea where you've got a now a, a completely digital camera. It's one cord to the computer, and your computer can get power and do everything. So that's really sort of the, the very, very basic setup uh, for EAA, and it can get very um, extreme uh, beyond that, depending upon your scope and that sort of thing. Um, now, just the basic concept of, well, how do you do this? Uh, very similar to imaging, but I have to preface this with the, what I think is the perfect solution, the perfect way to do it. And that is, unfortunately, that no perfect exists. Just like everything else we do in astronomy, um, a perfect solution does not exist and there will always be a compromise. Um, no one solution is necessarily better than another. It's going to really depend on what works best for you and your circumstances. Um, also willing to know or willing to note that um, because your goals and circumstances may change over time, that your equipment needs to be um, adaptable or you need to be able to um, you know, sell old things, buy new things, uh, depending upon what your goals are. So um, again, I, I always recommend folks to start with simple and something that will enable you to meet um, you know, your first round of that said we can pretty much simplify eaa into two excuse me two what i call simple steps um, and the first is to just capture that exposure if we think about what the goal is and we think about that comparison we did earlier of um, the ring nebula it's about getting an object that is brighter, more colorful, and more detailed than if we were just using an eyepiece. And this is accomplished through, obviously, our camera. And it's all about just taking an exposure. And it's you know how much time that we're going to let that camera collect one picture on its chip. The um, longer the exposure, we're going to get more light. We're going to get something that's going to be brighter, more colorful, and more detailed. However, that comes as, as, at a cost, potentially. And that resulting image could be subject to electronic noise from the camera, any sort of tracking issues or limitations with your mount. Again, if you're using a, uh, an alt-as mount, there's only so much uh, or so long you'll be able to do and then other objects um, interfering with your exposures, whether that's airplane or um, some uh, space satellites. Um, we won't even we won't even touch that just yet. But um, again, you're you're subject uh, to potential problems the longer the exposure is. So, what do you do? Well, that's where the second part comes in, and because. Again, the cameras, mounts, sky conditions, all of that could potentially limit what you can do with a single exposure. We need to uh, be able to put them together. And that ace of, up, up our sleeve is called stacking. And kind of what it sounds like. Um, a camera is going to take single exposure, 
exposure, and they're basically going to add the images on top of each other. And remember, this is all digital, so it's literally adding the ones and zeros that are basically represent our data, um, and it's able to add it together, and then eventually turn it into a um, a single uh, result, um, one image. Um, and I know the, you know, again, it's it's an inefficient process, but if you have a stack of six 10 second exposures, it's kind of like a 60 second exposure. Uh, again, there's inefficiencies in it, but that, that, that's basically the idea. Um, and when we're combining our exposures, we can think of it as there's two different ways to do it kind of in, in their very broad buckets. It can either be done inside the camera. Uh, oftentimes that's called integration or hardware stacking. That's what the uh, Revolution 2, I mentioned that uh, camera before. Um, that's what it does and what my first camera did. It was done inside the camera. Then you can do it outside the camera. That's often referred to as software stacking or just stacking. Um, now, the devil really is in the details. And you know, I, I tried to simplify it into two different steps, and that's really what it is. But there's a lot that you need to do with the software, um, and it can get very confusing uh, across all the different camera models that are out there, uh, and especially the software packages. So if someone's really interested in EAA, I can, I, you know, I highly, highly recommend uh, the EAA um, subgroup on cloudynights.com. And of course, um, you know, experimentation. Um, just get out there and and see what it. Um, so I wanted to share. I know we're kind of running close on time. I wanted to share just some examples uh, of of what we've uh, I've been able to capture in the past. So this was my standard resolution CCD camera, and again, standard resolution being you know, what was it 640 over 480. Um, you know, pixel size. So this is, uh, in essence, um, a little bit blockier, not as much detail. Again, this was really, really, these are really fast acquisitions, um, but they were small and uh, they, they didn't have the necessary detail that I was really looking for. And that's what prompted me to go to a, uh, a CMOS camera. My first one was a cooled a camera called the, uh, the 385. And I was much happier with the result detail i really liked it what i noticed though um was i probably didn't look at this enough and although this is a great camera and it wasn't it was not very expensive um in comparison to other ones it didn't necessarily have the, the what we call the well depth or i noticed that um and the sculpture galaxy is a really good example of that it was hard to really get kind of that black background you know uh kind of uniform compared to what I can do with other cameras. Um, so again, it just it, it just didn't give me that enough a range um, in, in the uh, which is why I updated or I basically upgraded to the um, the 533. And so the, this my current camera, um, some a, examples of, of things I've been able to capture. Um, I've got about a 0.6 of a degree field of view um, setup. And I'll leave you with this final example. Um, and one of the things I really like to do with uh, when, in terms of my observing, and again, I always call it when I have BAA because it's me, it's about the, the object, not necessarily about developing a picture, getting a, a, a picture for me. But I was out. Um, this is about a year ago, and um, I was working on my Herschel 400, and there's a Galaxy on the list, uh, and a few others, NGC 1275. So I had it out, and I was really looking forward to this because I knew, based upon my um, my software, um, my star maps, that there, I should be able to get lots of other Galaxies in there. So I was really looking forward to it. And this is what I got. So here we've got. Um, my field of view, we've got NGC 1275 in, in, the, in the frame here. You start to see those galaxies. But as this was kind of building and building the picture, I just started noticing it. I'm seeing more galaxies than I could see on my star charts. 
So I decided to count them all. There are 53 galaxies in this view. The closest of which is that NGC 75 at, I can't remember exactly how many light years distance, but call it, you know, two or 300 uh, million light years. And the other parts just blew me away. And just, you know, I got, I saw it. I saw this whole big cluster. Um, I was just, I was blown away. Um, and this now has gotten me very doing more galaxy clusters. Um, but that's really kind of what, uh, at least to me, um, what just keeps me going in, um, in, in EAA because you never know how far you're going to be able, to, how deep you're going to get. Uh, and I've noticed that pretty much I can go deeper than most of the star atlases um, that are out there. So with that, I want to open it up for uh, questions. Um, anything we have from you folks. Well, thank you very much, Michael. That was a great, very interesting presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, if you're on Zoom, you'll need to unmute yourself if you're muted. I see a couple of people are. Um, and let's see, uh, the Nature Center is unmuted. I don't know if you have the microphone working there, Wayne. But, the microphone um, doesn't work. All we have is my laptop, so. Okay. But okay. thanks for the presentation. We appreciate it here. My pleasure. So at the Nature Center, Wayne, they can probably walk up to the laptop and ask. Yes. Or you, if you're online, you could also uh, enter a question in the chat. Michael, for uh, what it's worth, I, I have dabbled in this on and off, and I did start with the LN300 camera. Uh, yep. And I worked up to the uh, ZWO something, an earlier camera, but that, but I got so frustrated, I gave up. <laughs> I, I just the learning curve was steep, it's, like you said. It it it, it is. Um, and I have to say, I'm not sure I would have really devoted the time if I had not gone to that star that basically star party. And I, I don't know if it's, it's still being is still going on, but yeah, um, you know, it because it, it's it's hard to taste success. Um, and I'm I'm working on several videos right now, YouTube videos to kind of help people um, be able to taste success the first time out. It might not be a great view, but it'll be something. So and I something, think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was there a question uh, I thought at the Nature Center? Any questions here? Nope, we're good here, Mark. All right. Okay. Fantastic. Any Anybody online, last, last chance? All right. Well, great. Fantastic, Michael. Well, again, thank you very much. We we appreciate your time yep. and your expertise. My pleasure. Yeah, and, thank you uh, again. Yeah, and just, uh, I'll do one quick shout out um, for anyone that's looking for a great um, kind of either uh, October star party, even a in the late March star party. Um, one that I usually attend is, um, is, they call it Stanton River, although if you look at it, it you would think it's pronounced Staunton River, um, but Staunton River Star Party in the southern part of Virginia is a fantastic star party. Um, decent uh, dark skies, um, about Bortle, call it uh, five, maybe four. Um, so you know, not good skies, fantastic uh, amenities, uh, power on the field. So uh, if parties your kind of thing, check it out. Um, and it's run with from the Chapel Hill Astronomical Observing Society, or CHAOS for short. Okay, great. Great information. Sure. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, clear in the skies. Yeah, thank you. Thank all you right. very much. Bye, all. Thank you. Anything else, Mark?